So as we left off with last time we started talking about fatigue, um, you may remember that we had a chart that gave us uh, a fatigue strength. That's what you see over here on the left side. Gives us a fatigue strength as a function of number of cycles. Right? And this, the data points that you see along here are fairly typically shaped for steels. All right? So the shape of this curve is, uh, you know, it's fairly consistent among the family of steels, all right? And we defined a few things whenever we met last time. We defined things like uh, this level down here where it, you know, we, when it reaches that level right there, any stresses below that level, and we would predict that the uh, part would last forever, right? And we call that the endurance limit, okay? And that's what we're going to focus on a little bit today is... We, we uh, mentioned last time that there was an, an uncorrected versus a corrected endurance limit. And the only thing that we really did last time was an uncorrected endurance limit. And how did we find that typically for steels? The very rough explanation of that is that it's going to be about half of the ultimate strength. That was based on uh, the chart over here where we have this scattered data. Um, and we saw that the slope of the line that, that relates tensile strength to endurance limit, uh, that slope is about half, and so that's where we get that relationship that about half of the uh, tensile strength is, gives us that endurance limit. But then I was very careful when we met last time to mention several times that that made a lot of assumptions about the material, and what we're going to do this time is go through some factors that allow us to correct for conditions of our material that may occur in actual practice, because we're not always going to have perfectly polished parts that are at room temperature, et cetera. All right? So what happens as we begin to correct this endurance limit is the level of this line tends to start dropping. Right? We might find a new location of this line, and it'll still be sort of assumed to be flat, but it's going to reduce in value as we have various factors that begin to apply to our material. And what happens with the rest of this curve, basically, is that we lower uh, that line to where it, you know, it would reduce all of those things as well. Uh, we are typically going to assume that we aren't really going to move that uh, point up there on the upper part of this curve. All right, so this is where we're going today. And you see down here, I've got endurance limit corrections. These are often called Marin factors, right? And this, uh, this list of Marin factors that we have is not necessarily exhaustive, okay? So uh, these are ones that are very common. These are ones that you probably should think about. But in specific applications where you might be designing specific types of parts, uh, there might be another Marin factor that gets applied in, in another way or various ways. And so um, it's a, this is a good start to kind of think about some of these Marin factors. And uh, whatever you end up designing in your career, there may be others as well. So I'll just put that on there as sort of a little uh, asterisk. All right, so let's start going through these Marin factors. The basic construction here is that we have all these Marin factors, and the presumption is that most of them or all of them are going to be less than 1, right? So every time we multiply by a number less than 1, we are taking the endurance limit that we would have had uh, for a perfectly polished rotating bending specimen, and we're reducing it to figure out what our corrected uh, endurance limit is that's over there on the left. And so I'm just going to start going through these and mentioning what they are, and then we will work a problem after this uh, where we see how to use them, okay? So the first one here, this one is called the surface factor. Okay, and the idea on that surface factor is that if you do not have a perfectly smooth outer surface of your part, then the roughness that's on the outer surface of that part becomes uh, a potential location where a crack could start, right? Any of the roughness that you have on the surface, there are little tiny stress concentrations that happen due to the fact that there's roughness on the surface, and that is a potential place where a crack could begin, and because you're in this cyclic loading type of a scenario, 
since that crack, you know, as it begins, it will actually be more likely to propagate and to begin in the first place. So there's, there's a reason why um, we try to make things as smooth as possible if we are planning on loading them in a fatigue orientation. So this is uh, one of the factors, okay? Uh, case of B, okay, this is a size factor. Okay, and the idea on the size factor is that what we are doing here is a design technique that is basically using deterministic mathematics to describe what is actually a stochastic uh, phenomena, which is it, that right there we sort of have a little bit of an issue. And the reason that this is a stochastic phenomena is that material defects tend to be a random phenomena. Right? We can't necessarily predict exactly how the defects are going to be inside of a material. And the defects are considered to be what begins fatigue type of uh, processes. And so, pardon? So these things can happen in several different ways, but uh, let's think about, for instance, maybe in a cast material. If you have a cast material, and let's say you used a sand casting technique, okay? a little bit of sand might end up in the middle of your material, okay. all right? If that happens, then right there at that location, it's not gonna have the same strength properties, yeah. right? Even if you don't have a cast uh, type of a, a part, uh, any number of other issues can happen, you know, in even things like interesting grain boundaries between little grains of material that might compose a metal, that could create at one particular, you know, microscopic location in the material, it could end up making a spot where stresses are, are concentrated a little bit more than in other places, and that could basically represent something of a defect and a p potential place where the fatigue um, processes might begin. So anyway, my point with all of this is that um, all of these issues are kind of stochastic, and the, uh, the severity of those increases as the amount of material where it could happen increases, all right? And so what we do with the size factor is we basically try to make a, a, uh, a correction to go back to the size of material where we would have thought about doing the rotating bending test, right? Kind of going back to that size. Um, in other words, you know, we generated all this data based on a particular size. Right? We can correct a little bit if it's different than that size uh, based on the fact that if you have a larger part, you have more locations where those fatigue phenomena could begin. Right? So the larger amount of highly stressed area that you have of your part, the more likely that you're going to have a place where fatigue begins. And so that, there's another factor here that sort of corrects our endurance limit based on that phenomena. Yeah. So one of the things we're going to see in just a minute, um, I'll go ahead and answer that question now, but one of the things that can happen is, yes, that number can end up being larger than one. The recommendation that they use in this text is that if you get a value larger than one, cap it at one, all right, as far as design technique. That is, you know, ostensibly somewhat conservative, but that's what their recommendation is, is to not actually use values even if they do uh, get larger than one. So it's a good observation. All right, so that's size factor. Uh, the next one that we have here is called the loading factor. The loading factor is actually kind of a special case of the size factor because depending on how things are loaded, uh, it could end up you know, making more area or less area highly stressed. So I'll give you an example. What if you have a pure axial loading? How much of the area of your purely axially loaded material reaches the highest levels of stress? What percentage of it? So it might be kind of a tricky question. All of it, right? If it's axially loaded and it's kind of got uniform load and everything, there's no discontinuities. We'll deal with that in a separate uh, spot in the lecture. But if you're just loading something axially, then your entire area reaches those highest levels of stress. Okay, so that's kind of a bad deal, right? Um, if you have rotating bending, 
All right, that is the exact type of stress that originally generated the data we have up on this chart anyway. And so what we have for our loading factor, if you have rotating bending, is nothing. We just have a factor of one. In other words, that's what we had the other way. And then the other type of loading that they described there is torsion. And what that factor is that they have uh, listed in the book, it accounts mostly for the idea that material strength is different in shear than it is in a normal orientation. All right, so that's what that factor is actually accounting for for that particular case of, of uh, torsion is the idea that you have to adjust your strength values to get to uh, appropriate things for shear. Okay, so that's what we're doing with the loading factor. And those are the, typically the three big kinds of loads that we expect to carry is bending, uh, torsion, and axial. So that's what that factor does. Uh, K sub D, all right, so I'll go down here. K sub D, this is called the temperature factor. Okay, if you have materials that are very, very ele elevated temperatures, then that elevated temperature tends to weaken your material, and it will tend to reduce your endurance limit. The weird thing about the temperature factor is that there is a slightly elevated temperature range where it actually improves your material's uh, resistance to fatigue. Right? The, actually, the number that, that goes in right there does actually rise to be a little bit more than one uh, in certain temperature range that's just a little bit elevated above room temperature. The reason for that it has to do with the idea that certain materials might be more ductile and kind of more, easy, more easily can they heal themselves, so to speak, right? Which is kind of what ductile materials do. Um, they can heal themselves a little bit more easily at a slightly elevated temperature, and yet it's not so elevated that it starts to um, you know, affect the strength values for the material. So that's uh, an interesting thing for the temperature factor. And then here for K sub E, this one is called the reliability factor. Okay, here's what this one does. If you look at this spread of data that we have uh, for the original value of 0.5, um, and actually, again, that doesn't go the whole way. It goes up to here and cuts over. But either way that you use that, like whether you're in the, the top part where it caps off or in the other one, um, you'll notice there that about half of this data lies below that line. Would you agree? Okay. So if half of that data lies below that line, then the possibility exists that your particular type of material that you are using for your design might be one of the samples that would have been down there, in which case you wouldn't actually have the endurance strength that you would have predicted. Do you agree? So what you can do with the reliability factor um, is you can effectively sort of uh, reduce the slope of this line and get it to the point where fewer of these data points would lie below your line. That's kind of functionally what that K sub E factor does, is it makes it to where a smaller percentage or even, you know, almost none of your data points would lie below that line, okay? So that's what the reliability factor does. And then my favorite of all is K sub F. This is miscellaneous effects factor. which is great, you know, you, I love that. It's like, we're gonna calculate all these things and there might be some more too, okay? That's basically how you should read that, all right? The reason that's in there is to kind of address what I mentioned earlier when I first started talking, is that, um, you know, there can be other factors that people begin to notice in the design of certain types of parts. Like, a, you know, after having a bunch of experience designing certain type of thing, the designers that work in that area start realizing that there's another factor that kind of influences what the effective endurance limit is for that material, and so they start gathering enough data to where they can kind of make a good estimate of another factor to throw in here. And this K sub F is basically just an acknowledgement of that fact, right? That you may end up putting more factors into this 
expression than just the ones that are listed. So the ones that are, you know, A through E, those are ones that are very common that you might do on a, on a regular basis. And then there might be others based on specific uh, applications. And of course, S sub E prime is your, uh, you know, your uncorrected endurance limit. All right, so these are all our, of our Marin factors. Not bad, huh? All right, so the next thing we want to do is talk about the idea of stress concentration. Because stress concentration matters a lot to us in fatigue type of uh, scenarios. It doesn't matter as much for us in static loading. The reason why is that in static loading, if you just put a load on something and it, let's say it does yield at some microscopic little point in the material, it yields a little bit, there is not really much of a consequence if you're dealing with a ductile material to it yielding just a little bit at some location in the material, all right? Whereas if you are putting a alternating load on a part, then what happens is it will yield over and over and over and over again at that location and it will begin to start compromising the material, okay? So we care about stress concentrations even in ductile materials in fatigue type of uh, you know, loading arrangements. And so uh, the thing that I'll put down here is that our basic equation that we use for fatigue or for our stress concentrations is that we are going to come up with a maximum stress based on K sub F, which is a fatigue stress concentration factor. Right? We're going to base this on that fatigue stress concentration factor times what is often called a nominal stress. Nominal stress is what you would calculate if you weren't aware that such a thing as a stress concentration might exist. Right? It's just what you would have calculated all the way back in a class like Engineering 220. Okay? So this is the basic equation. And you might notice here, well, that's K sub F. What does that mean? All right? This is actually a different K than the ones that you learned about way back in the day uh, when we learned about stress concentration factors. The, one, the uh, value or the variable that we use for regular stress concentration factors, they're actually called theoretical stress concentration factors. Um, those are a little bit different than what they prove to be effectively in fatigue scenarios. And so that's another place where we have a slight correction from what the theoretical stress concentration factor is to what a fatigue stress concentration factor is. And that is based on, a, uh, on an equation here that is this. There's a few kind of in a row here. There's K sub F ends up being one plus Q times K sub T. K sub T there is the theoretical stress concentration factor, which is something that you would look up off of a chart in a similar way to how you're used to from previous classes. You could look up that stress concentration factor uh, from a chart. And what we do is we correct this a little bit with this equation and this variable Q. Q is uh, called a notch sensitivity. Okay, here's what that means. So if you have a really strong material, what tends to happen as your steel gets really, really strong is it usually also gets more brittle. Okay, so it's, it's really strong, but it's also not as capable as much um, of deforming plastically before it starts to give up. Okay, and if you have a material that's like that, it is a lot less able to, I've been using the phrase self-heal, that's not that official a term, but it gives you a good mental picture of what goes on inside of the material. Um, if you have a really strong material, um, it is generally less able to do that, and your value for K sub F will start getting closer and closer to being K sub T. Whereas if you have a material that's less strong, and therefore probably more ductile, it is more able to sort of heal itself when it has little tiny bits of yielding that happen at these highly stressed areas due to stress concentrations. And what tends to happen is your effective stress concentration that you actually will sort of observe based on how your materials really do behave, it starts to decline relative to K sub T. 
right? So if you have a softer material, something that's not as strong, K sub F can be reduced relative to K sub T more than if you have a uh, really strong material, right? Now, how do you work with Q? Well, there's kind of a chain of different things here. Q is equal to 1 over uh, 1 plus the square root of A over the square root of R. Now we got more letters, right? This square root of A is known as a Neuber constant, okay? That is something that is also a function of strength of material, all right? And the R that you see under this radical is basically your radius that you have for your discontinuity that's causing your stress concentration. All right, so based on these values, you can come up with a notch, sens notch sensitivity value that you can plug into this equation and get K sub F from K sub T. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? We'll do an example here in just a second, but I wanted you to kind of see the, the process there and understand at its root, why is it that we have a different value for K sub F versus K sub T, and then a little bit of the process of how we get there. Okay, uh, real quick, let me slide over here and show you the problem that we're actually about to solve. Okay, we're gonna solve a problem where we have a plate that is loaded with two, we'll say concentrated load. It's not a good idea to do that in, in simulation software, right? We have two concentrated loads that happen on this plate and the plate has a hole in the middle of it. And we are simply supporting the plate on the edges, okay? And what I want you to see here is a little bit of a visual of what that stress concentration might look like for the hole, right? It's got these spots right here that uh, seem like they have fairly high levels of stress concentration. And I just wanted you to kind of have a visual of where do these stress concentrations occur for a part that is built like this, all right? So, here's our example problem. We have a plate of material. It is hot rolled 1030 steel. And the surface is not modified. In other words, however it came out of the hot rolling process, that is still what the surface of this part looks like. Okay? Um, we want to design a part that is set up like this where it has a hole going through the middle of a plate and is loaded in this way. We want to set it up so that it has 95% reliability. In other words, you know, no more than 5% of the times that we might build something like this would it fail earlier than we expect. Okay. We are going to operate it at 700 degrees Fahrenheit. And what we want to do is we want to find the factor of safety against fatigue, assuming that we want this thing to last an infinite number of cycles. All right. Does everyone feel good about this? Maybe. Maybe not. All right, where would you like to start? Okay, if you want, we can start by uh, evaluating for this material, we can start by evaluating um, what is our fully corrected endurance limit. And to do that, we need to start working on all these Marin factors. So I'm, I'm fine with that, okay. Marin factors. Okay, so the first one that we might want to look at is the surface factor, K sub A. Okay, K sub A occurs in this form. It is basically a constant A times the ultimate strength of the material raised to the B, okay? And that is on page 295. This is equation 619. OK, 
Okay. What about A and B? Well, there's a little table on the following page, page 296. There's a table 6-2, where we get A and B. Okay, how do we look it up? Some of you may be following along. It basically has uh, sort of textual descriptions of various types of common surface finishes. All right? And it gives you estimations for what A and B might be for those types of sur surface finishes. The options there are ground is one of them, machined or cold drawn is another category, hot rolled is a third category, and as forged is a fourth category. So what do you think we should do? Okay. We basically said that we have a surface that's not modified after going through its hot rolling process, and so that might suggest that we should use the hot rolled uh, category, which I will do. So K sub A then becomes 14.4 is the number that you use if we are dealing with S sub UT values that are in KSI. Okay, times S sub UT, and I didn't mention that earlier, but to save me a little bit of time, I went ahead and pre-looked up the ultimate strength value for this type of material, it is 68 KSI. Okay, that's based on table A20. So 68 KSI. A quick comment that I will make here is I wrote it down to 68, 68 KSI. What you probably want to do here is strip units. Why is that? Yeah, you just make sure you use the right, um, you know, A factor there that's made for the right type of unit. These are very empirical equations, right? So they're not, you're not going to try to chase the units through the whole thing. You're just going to say, if we are in KSI for this number that we're plugging in, uh, we're going to use this value of 14.4 and an exponent of negative 0.718. Right? And when I plug those in, I get a value that is 0 0.696. Okay. Let me make one more comment about the surface factor real quick. Um, generally, what you, what's best to do when you're trying to evaluate what kind of a surface factor you should use, you need to think about two things. Where is the most highly stressed area of the material? And what was the last process that was done to that material at that location? Okay, here's why I bring that up. This is a hot rolled plate, right? What would happen if I took this hot rolled plate and I went to another uh, manufacturing process where I then ground it? and I took the surface of the, you know, that came out of the hot rolling process and I, and I ground it, what would happen? I'd probably go into a different category for surface finish, right? Because it literally has to do what, what does the surface look like? And these categories that we have for surface finish are just based on generally what kind of surface finish do you expect will come out of these types of processes? Right? And so you have to look at what's the last one that happened in the process, and uh, you know, is, it, you know is, is that last one that happened in the process, try to match it as best you can with the descriptions that you have in the table right here. Um, I would actually say that for this particular example, a case could be made that rather than using uh, hot rolled, we might use machined. Why do you think that would be? The hole was probably drilled, right? And so if you think about the inner surface of the hole, it is probably going to have a, a surface finish that is more closely related to something that would be machined rather than something that would be, uh, you know, hot rolled. 
All right. So anyway, this one's kind of tricky which one you should use because the very top surface would probably be more like uh, hot rolled and then the inner surface right there would be more like uh, machined. So in, in real practice, the main thing is to be able to justify why you made the decision you made. Right. In, uh, as it pertains to the problems that I typically have you work, I don't ask you to make a lot of judgment calls about this. I will tell you, hey, for this one, use a ground surface finish type of thing, and I have you do the calculations based on that. Does that make sense? All right, so there's my surface factor. What's next? Size factor. Okay. <clears throat> and this one's especially interesting for this case because uh, what we see here for size factors, the main equation that we use is uh, equation 620 on page 296. Okay. But what you need to plug into 620, you need a diameter, right? Because the presumption of the equation on 620 is that you are going to have rotating bending, right, of a round circular uh, cross-section piece. Like that's the presumption of what you're dealing with for that equation that's on page 620. Is that what we have? Okay. It is not what we have. We actually have something that is not rotating, right? And it is bending, but that means that the area where the maximum stress occurs, actually I'll go back over and we'll look real quick at this picture, all right? And it's kind of interesting. You can probably see these colors right here. Um, these colors right here show that the maximum stress occurs to the outside. Right? And the basic philosophy and kind of uh, mentality of how this size factor is to be used, and actually what I'm, I'm going on a little bit here and talking about what is called an equivalent diameter. Right? We need a diameter to plug into equation 620, and we need to make something that is basically equivalent to the rotating bending specimen, but accounts for the amount of area that is, it, that is highly stressed in our actual situation. And the technique that they show in the book is basically look at the area that is stressed at 95% of the max or higher. So you kind of develop these zones. So for a rotating bending specimen, what would that zone look like? If this is a cross section of a rotating bending specimen, where is the stress going to be at 95% or higher at some point in the cycle of it rotating? Okay, yeah, you're going to basically sh d define, you know, a range past which everything out here, you know, is going to end up stressed at 95% or higher of your, um, you know, of your maximum. Okay, and you're basically saying that if there is going to be a uh, a location where a fault develops in the material, it's probably going to be in those highly stressed regions, right? So that's why we're trying to match these up, okay? And what we're going to do is try to figure out how would we figure out the equivalent diameter for something that was loaded like this, right? So that the same amount of cross-sectional area exists for our situation. I know that's a little bit convoluted, but that's how it works, okay? Uh, or at least that's the recommended procedure that they have here in Shigley. Okay. Um, let me mention one other, this isn't the one that we have, but one way that this can happen is if you have a round member that is not rotating, but it is bending. Where does your area where this maximum stress occurs now? Like where, what would that area look like? You'd basically chop a little bit off the top and a little bit off the bottom in the direction that it's being flexed, right? And if you look at their little uh, example that they do, they solve that particular case where you have a round piece but it's not rotating, and they come up with an expression that says the equivalent diameter is 0 0.370 times the actual diameter if, you're, uh, if you have this piece that's not rotating. So that's kind of interesting. I, I, uh, 
I like that. This isn't the case that we're solving, but this is, I figured I'd mention that that's what they're doing in those equations if you go through those in the book, okay? The one that we want to look at is actually more like equation 625. Because you see there, that is if you have a rectangular section that is not rotating. All right, so you have this rectangular section, and you can uh, find the equivalent diameter, d sub e, based on 0 0.808 times h times b. Okay, what do we mean by h and b? It says rectangular section of h times b. Okay, so what do we have for that? Okay, what we should probably do there is eliminate the whole, right, and just look at, you know, the piece of this cross section that would be right here. Okay, and so what would that look like? Okay, what we would have is, um, well, I guess I'll do the, the thickness first. The thickness of this thing is 0.375 inches. And then we'd multiply this by 5.625. That's 5 and 5 eighths inches minus 3 quarters of an inch. And this is all raised to the 1 half. <clears throat> All right, and so based on this, we can come up with an equivalent diameter for our rectangular piece that is flexing. And I get that it would be 1.0925. Inches. All right, well, now that I have an equivalent diameter, I can take that equivalent diameter and use it in equation 620. Okay, and actually before I do that, let me make mention of the ta a table that is on page 298, table 63. Okay, there are several other types of shapes that are shown right there that where it gives you some ways to evaluate your equivalent diameter for various other kinds of shapes. So it has an I-beam in there, it has a channel, uh, like a structural channel, it has rectangle and circular, you know, non-bending circular, or excuse me, non-rotating circular shape. All right, so equation 620 then, which is on page 296, we have to know if our equivalent diameter is between 0.11 and 2 inches or between 2 and 10 inches, all right? And I would say we're in the first category there. And so the equation becomes D over 0.3, okay? So K sub B here is D over 0.3 raised to the negative uh, 0 0.107. Are These are all empirically derived equations, meaning they did experiments and they tried to come up with ways to deal with uh, various changes in geometry and so forth. And uh, so that's why they're all kind of weird, right? The, they're things that you wouldn't necessarily be, be able to arrive at just by thinking about it. Right, you'd actually have to do experiments to get these. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of old stuff too. I mean, this stuff is, has been around and existed for quite a while. Um, but, all right, let's see, where are we at here? This ends up being uh, 0 0.8708. for our size factor, okay? Not all of these will go this slowly. So if you're feeling like, oh my gosh, this is going insanely slow, they're not all this bad. 
Like for instance, the loading factor. Yeah, we have 0.8708. Okay, our next one, we'll do the loading factor. Okay, for the loading factor, we basically have to answer the question, it's, this is on page 298, equation 626. We only have to answer the question of do we have bending, do we have axial, or do we have torsion? All right? And if our answer is we have bending, which that's our answer, right? That's the main type of stress that we're dealing with in this situation. Then K sub C is equal to 1. That was easy, all right? So now we're gonna move on and do K sub D, which is the temperature factor. Okay, for temperature factor, um, we are basically just using table 6-4. Okay, table 6-4 allows us to look up a given temperature and the, va the variable that you see uh, listed next to that temperature is your factor, right? That's your uh, K sub D factor. So we're at 700 degrees Fahrenheit and table 6-4 says that our K sub D should be 0.927. for a temperature of 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. <clears throat> There's actually two things that you can do um, if you land somewhere in between places on this table. Okay. Like if you don't end up right in one spot, the immediate thing that you might think to do is to interpolate, right? But there's actually another equation down here as well, equation 627. And it actually gives you a nonlinear expression that allows you to find K sub D if you have a temperature value in Fahrenheit. Okay, so that's, I'll mention that as well. All right, so we got A, B, C, D. Yes, sir. If it's below 70 F, um, then you just let that value be one. And actually that's true like in terms of just the practical, when I give you homework problems, what should you assume, all that good stuff. Um, if I don't say anything about it, then the presumption should be use a K sub D value of one. Like if I don't tell you what temperature it's operating at, then you can just assume that it must not be something that you need to adjust for. Sound good? All right, so we've done all of those things. We've done through D. Now we need to do E. E, K sub E, is our reliability factor. Okay, so we flip another page over, and we have a reliability factor um, that, again, has another table. Table 6-5. We want 95% reliability, right? That was what was originally in the uh, specifications of the problem. And so 95% reliability, we look across and see that our reliability factor should be 0.868.
Okay, and again, what that is adjusting for is the idea that the spread of this data way up here on this chart, uh, we drew that line right through the middle of it at first. And what we're correcting for here is the idea that we want, instead of us, our, our uh, prediction going right through the data, we want it to go below all the data so that, you know, in our worst case scenarios of, you know, we may have gotten a sample of material where it was worse than average, we'll still be safe. Okay, so we're basically, by choosing a 95% reliability, we're basically saying 95% of these data points will be above this line. Okay. All right, what about case of F? Well, generally for, for right now, um, the only time you would use a case of F is if I just told you, hey, there's also such and such an effect, use a case of F of, right? That's at this point, you know, if you find anything like that that's any of the problems that I give you, uh, it's unlikely that you guys will have a level of experience or, you know, resources that would inform you about what to use for a case of F value. Um, so be watchful for it in case I do throw something like that your way, but it's not something that uh, you generally have to make sure you throw that in there unless you, you know, it really makes it clear that you need it. All right, so there's all of our Marin factors. What do we do with all of them? Okay, SE becomes K sub A. What was K sub A? It's 0.696. K sub B was 0.8708. Okay, K sub C was just one. K sub D was 0.927. K sub E is 0.868. And what's SE prime? Okay, we have one half of whatever our ultimate strength was, which was 68 KSI. Okay, so maybe put in here 0.5 times 68 KSI. And so our fully corrected endurance limit then is going to be, if I did all this correctly, 16.585 KSI. which is a lot lower than 68, right? All right, cool. Now what? Okay, we probably need to find a nominal stress, right? We're gonna need, definitely need to do that at some point. So let's do that. How would we figure out a nominal stress? Okay, we probably would want to make a cut through the middle of the circle. I agree with that. And what we probably want to do is figure out what the bending moment is that's being carried at that cut that goes through the middle of the circle. So how would I figure out that bending moment? Okay, what if we do a quick shear and bending moment diagram? What reaction would we have at the left end? 90 pounds up, and that would go to where? Okay, five inches in, it would go to 90 pounds down. Whoops. It would go 90 pounds down from where it was, sorry, and be flat across till we get to this other location. Go another 90 pounds down and then go 90 pounds up. 
This is V in pounds. Okay, what would the bending moment diagram look like? Probably have a slope that went up to here and then over and back down, right? And the height that it gets to, which is, this is the bending moment that will be at the location of the hole, right? The height that it gets to, which I can express this in inch pounds, I guess, okay? The height that it gets to is what? Okay, it'll be the area of that rectangle right there. Okay, so the height of that rectangle is 90 pounds, and the width of that rectangle is 5 inches. So 90 pounds times 5 inches gives us 450 inch pounds. And that's the bending moment that occurs at the location where the hole is. Well, how do I figure out nominal stress? Okay, well, you do an MC over I, right? You look at this section through the middle of this hole. The moment is 450 inch pounds. What is C? Okay, it'll be half of the 3 8 inch thickness, right? So that would be 0.375 inches over 2. And then what would my moment of, of inertia, my second moment of area, what would that be? Whoop, we don't have any pies in there. What would it be? Yeah, we need base times height cubed over 12. So what's the base? 5.625 inches wide. The height is 3 eighths of an inch. Ooh, good question. Would we subtract the circle? Do we account for that with a stress concentration, or does, should that be in the nominal stress? Are you just saying that because you didn't think I would make a mistake? You should know better than that by now. Okay, I do need to subtract the whole. Okay, I do need to subtract the width of that hole from the base of this, and then what? Okay, then I need the 0.375 inches. That would be cubed, and all this would be divided by 12. All right, and when we plug all that in, our nominal stress that we have due to flexure is going to be 3938.5 PSI. Yeah, the thickness is right here. Sorry, I should have emphasized that a little bit more. Okay, so there's our nominal stress. Now we need to figure out what's the stress concentration factor, okay, or our fatigue stress concentration factor, correct? But to do that, I need a few things. One of the things that I need is a theoretical stress concentration factor. All right, where do I get that from? Never thought you'd ask. 
see if I can find it over here. I think I've dropped it on my page. Maybe I didn't. Oh, I think I must, there it is. Slid it way down here. All right, this is our situation that we are dealing with. It is a plate that is being flexed. This is in the back. This is actually in uh, A15. In the back of the book. Okay. So what we need to figure out are some of our ratios. So the first one is we need to know which curve we are on. And so D over H, all right, we have a hole that's three quarters of an inch in diameter. So D over H is going to be equal to th uh, three quarters of an inch. And H is uh, 0.375 inches. So we have two. That means we're on this curve. The next thing we need to do is find D over W. Okay, and so D over W is equal to 0.75 inches, and W is the overall width of the whole thing. Okay, and so that would be 5.625 inches, and this will put us at a value of, see if I have this written down, 0 0.13333. So how do we use these things? Well, I go to 0 0.13333. And I have a K sub T value equal to 1.8. But that's not quite enough yet, is it? Not yet. So, so far I have K sub T equal to 1.8. What I need is K sub F, and K sub F requires that I have this other value of Q. To get Q, I need my Neuber constant, square root of A. So let me start there. Square root of A, there's a nice, messy uh, equation that's in your book. It's another nice empirical equation, 0.246 minus 3.08. Times 10 to the negative 3 times s sub ut plus 1.51 times 10 to the minus 5 times s sub ut squared minus 2.67 times 10 to the minus 8 times s sub ut cubed. And what you want to do is you want to plug in S sub ut in KSI and strip your units. Okay, so we plug in 68 KSI in here, but we don't put the KSI, we just put 68 each place that we have an S sub UT. And what we get for this Neuber constant is, see if I have it down here, uh, square root of A is going to be 0 0.098. Okay. Well, how do I use that? <clears throat> okay, well, our equation I wrote a, a few minutes ago for Q is that it is 1 over 1 plus the square root of A, which I just found, over the square root of R. 
So this is 1 over 1 uh, plus 0 0.098. And by the way, what would the units be on that? I didn't put them down here. It'll be in the square root of inches. And then what do we put in the denominator? Square root of 0.75 inches over 2. Why that? That's the radius of that hole. And what you're always doing with these is you're taking the radius of the discontinuity for that R value. And so our notch sensitivity number that we come up with here is 0 0.862. Yes, sir. Square root of inches. Yes. Okay, that's just a unit. That's a unit. Okay. Uh, that equation is, let me find that real quick. Yep, 635A, if you are talking about bending your axial, basically if you're talking about normal stresses, if you're talking about a shearing stress, there's a different one. Okay. All right, so now we have Q we can find k sub f. We're really almost there, I promise. So k sub f ends up being 1 plus q, which is 0 0.862, multiplied by uh, k sub t. k sub t is 1.8 minus 1. And that gives us a k sub f value of 1.69. And so real quick, I'll just co uh, comment. You can compare your k sub t versus your k sub f. And it actually did decline a little bit, right? That's because this is not a super, super duper strong steel. OK? All right. We're, we're really almost there. What do we need to do for our last step? OK, I'll tell you what, I'll combine everything in our last step to find factor of safety. A lot of times we use a subscript of F for fatigue, right? Our factor of safety here is going to be what? S sub E over the max stress that we see which is a reversing stress because this is plus and minus 90 pounds, right? It's a fully reversed stress. Okay, so what was our S sub E value? If I remember correctly, it was 16.585 KSI, and our maximum stress is going to be equal to 1.69 Um, multiplied by our nominal stress, which is up here, 3938.5 PSI, which would just be 3.938.5 KSI. That deserves a double box right there. Okay. So that would be our factor of safety uh, against fatigue for a part that is flexed in this way. What do you think we're going to do next time? We don't always have just a fully reversed load. Sometimes it's somewhere in between fully reversed or repeating. Right, so we're going to do something different there. Yes, sir. This one right here? 
That is equation 632. All right. Thank you for your attention. I'll see you later.